Church, I'm excited. It's time to do a Bible study. Please open your Bibles. I'm excited to ask you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 1. Let's pray. Uh, the title of our message is, What Heaven Will Be Like. What Heaven Will Be Like. Fascinating. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word Thank you for sending it forth in powers. Thank you for sending it with your heart after us. Thank you for pursuing us with your love. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, which is the presence of God among us. We open our heart to you. We ask that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation 21 is absolutely fascinating. When you get to this point of Revelation, now at this point, the seven-year tribulation period has Come and gone. That's that period of time where God's wrath will be poured out on the unbelieving, rebellious world. That will have been ended. At the end of the tribulation seven-year period, Christ returns uh, to the earth uh, in great power to rescue Israel. One of the reasons he comes, by the way, is to rescue Israel as the armies of the world have gathered together in the Jezreel Valley to destroy her. And uh, the Lord himself comes as a valiant champion and defeats the, uh, the enemies of Israel in that great day at the end of the tribulation. Then it tells us that he will rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. We were looking at that last weekend. He will rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. And he will be king of kings and lord of lords. And everyone shouts, hallelujah. What a grand day. What a glorious day. At that point then, when you get to uh, uh, Revelation 21, there will already will have been the judgment seat of believers, the judgment seat of Christ. There will already will have been the white throne judgment of non-believers. Uh, the, the enemy, Satan, the dragon of old, will have been loosed. If you remember, he was taken captive and held in the abyss for that period of a thousand years, at the end of which he was released for a short time to, the, to deceive the nations one final time. And there's going to be one final battle for anyone who chooses to rebel. At the end, uh, the battle of Gog and Magog. And, uh, and then at that point, Satan will be cast into fire in eternal judgment, the lake of fire. That brings us to the point where we are right now, right? In, in, in Revelation 21, we begin to look at eternity and beyond. Okay, that's a little humor from a movie. Eternity and beyond, right? Now, it's important to recognize why God is revealing these things now, why he reveals these things to see, for us to see in advance. Because he's preparing us for eternity. Blessed is he, he says. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and heeds the things written in them because the time is near. There's a sense of urgency. And there ought to be a sense of urgency when you look around what's happening in this world. 2020 is, is a year for the books, I'm telling you. This is like the year that many people woke up spiritually because there's a spiritual discernment that many people have that there is something going on in this world and there is a spiritual aspect to it. There's a spiritual warfare behind the things that are happening in this world. Many with spiritual discernment know it and they can see it. So God tells us these things in advance for that reason. Now, here's the thing also. Many people, you know, they have certain assumptions uh, when, when it comes to eternity, when it comes to heaven. But many of those assumptions, many of those uh, beliefs uh, often come from movies or pithy sayings or stories or even humor. And for some reason, uh, in all of the stories or humor or whatever, Peter is always the one standing at the gate welcoming people to heaven, okay? And I'm not sure where that comes from, but in all the, 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 the jokes and the stories, there's always Peter at the gate welcoming people to heaven. Like, for example, okay, like, for example, the story about when a pope and a politician both die in the same day, 
and they arrive together at the pearly gates of heaven where Peter, of course, greets them. The Pope, however, was rather surprised to see this uh, band of angels coming out to welcome the politician. Music is sounding and cheers and shouting of celebration as they pick up the politician on their shoulders and, and usher uh, uh, him into heaven, carrying them on their shoulders. Now, Peter could see the concerned look on the face of the Pope. And so he said, but is there something wrong? And well, well, said the Pope, uh, this isn't exactly how I envisioned it. Well, you have to understand, Peter answered, Popes we've seen before. But politicians? <laughs> okay, see, if you are here right now, you would be laughing because that is funny. Okay, but just for fun. But here's the thing. When most people, see, uh, they, they think of, the, of eternity. For example, you, you hear the phrase pearly gates. Well, what does that mean? Where does, where does that come from? Where does the, even the phrase pearly gates come from? Actually, it comes from the Bible. But the gates of what? The gates of heaven? What, what are we talking about? There is a biblical reference, and we're going to see what we're talking about right here. But it's not the gates of heaven up there. It's actually about a, an eternity on earth. Now, this is interesting. See, when most people think of eternity, they, may, they immediately imagine heaven up there with the Lord. But these verses that we're going to look at today give some interesting insight, shed light on eternity, and it's not what many people think. Eternity will not be in heaven. Now, let me just give you that statement and let that kind of just sit there. Eternity will not be in heaven. Now, that's for many people rather a shocking statement. What? All of my life. I had the understanding that eternity is in heaven. We're going to read it right now. Eternity is not in heaven. Eternity will be on earth, but not this earth. Not earth as we know it. Because earth itself will be made new. All right, let's read it. I'm sure you're intrigued. It's fascinating. Revelation 21, we're going to begin in verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea, which I find fascinating. And then he says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. Verse 5. And he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down. He's saying to John, Write this down, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. It is finished. I am the Alpha, and I am the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. All right there, that speaks of what it means to have the blessed gift of eternity. It's with God. He will be your father and you will be the son or daughter. And that relationship says it all. It's about that relationship of nearness and closeness. And it's been God's heart from the beginning to have relationship to those he made in his image. All right, these are the verses I want us to look at and see how they apply. There's much insight in these verses, starting with this. Eternity will be on a new earth. I've said it before. I want to lock it into our understanding. Eternity will be on a new earth. 
If you were to take a survey and ask people where they think they're going to spend eternity, most people would say, in heaven, up there. It's such a common understanding that whenever I'm speaking and teaching about eternity, I speak of heaven as well. Because if you have to try to explain it, many people will go, what? So for the sake of convenience and ease, I speak of eternity as, you know, in heaven. But here we learn that we will not live eternally in heaven, but rather we will live out eternity on earth. Here's the thing. It's not this earth. It's a new one. That's why it's important to recognize this truth. Everything here will burn. This earth, everything in it will burn. It's all destined for burning. It's important to remember because people put so much value on the things of the earth. But the things of the earth are destined to burn. Uh, let me give you a great scripture. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 13. Uh, he writes, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. In other words, like a thief in the night, which Jesus spoke of. In which the heavens will pass away with the roar. The elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all of these things. Now see, notice how he brings it to application. Since all of these things are to be destroyed in this way. What sort of people ought you to be? And then he, he, he says, in holy conduct. That's the answer. What sort of people ought you to be? In holy conduct, in godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You see, it's in several places in Scripture. And really what it shows us is that we need to change our perspective. When you recognize that this earth and all that it contains is destined to burn for destruction, it changes your whole view. It, it gives you a heavenly perspective. See, in other words, we need to make sure that we don't put too much uh, of our heart, don't invest too much of your heart in stuff that's going to burn. It's just going to burn. Don't put all of your heart in, in stuff. It's like Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, and literally that should be translated since you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That's your desire. Keep seeking the things above. It's like seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll add to you what you need. It says, set your minds on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Here's another one. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Jesus is teaching and he says, beware. When Jesus says beware, there's a powerful understanding that follows. Beware. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. That's not where life comes from. That's not where life comes from. I was thinking of an illustration. My old, my very first car, like when I was 16, my very first car, it only cost me a few hundred dollars because it was a beat up old yellow Toyota station wagon, old yellow. And it had dents on every corner and Bondo marks and my goodness. I tell you what, it was easy to not put much, put much value in that thing. That is until I bought my second car. My second car, 1971 AMC American Motors Javelin. Dark blue with the star skin hut stripe. I've got a picture of my old car. Would you, would you just, like, that was a car. Here's the thing. Yeah, it crashed. And, and it's all wrecked. And now it's sitting in some rusty, uh, uh, you know, 
place, dreaming of old days, listening to A-track tapes. <laughs> I had to add that in there. I don't know why. But my point is, look, that's all gone. It burned up. So what? See, in other words, we need to hold the things of the earth loosely. Value the things which are eternal. You want to, you want to be transformed? Change your view, he says. Hold the things of the earth loosely. Don't put so much in the things of the earth. Value the things which remain. Jesus called it laying up treasures in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, and here is the crux point of the verse, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your heart? That's the point of it. Where's your heart, man? And that's why, really, we can bring application this way. Redeem the time that you have. Redeem the time. What does it mean to redeem? Make value. Make value with the time. Hold the things of the earth loosely because everything here is destined to burn. Make the most of the time that you have on the earth. In the new heaven and the new earth, time will not be an issue. It's only an issue now. We have an awareness of time to help us Make the most of the opportunity. God has given us this opportunity to live out these years. It's a gift. We have a sense of time in the new heaven and the new earth. We won't be concerned of time. But now we have a sense of time. You know, it's interesting. Our dogs have no sense of, of time passing. Their agenda is simple, right? Play, eat, and sleep, usually in that order. Play, eat, and sleep. They don't care if they're getting old. They don't have any sense of getting old. They feel the effects of it, but they don't, they have no sense of the passage of time. We do. We have that sense of time, that, that sense of urgency. See, to me, that's the key. There needs to be a sense of urgency in how we live our lives. Make the most of what you have. I cannot tell you how many times my mother used to say that. Make the most of what you have. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. Paul writes, conduct yourselves. In other words, how do you live your life? Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Would you notice this next phrase? So in the context of redeeming the time, he then adds, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as though with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. In other words, this is one of the ways you redeem the time. By making sure that your speech is always with grace, seasoned as it were with salt. Because relationships are eternal relationships matter. See, when, when you let your speech be with grace, seasoned as though with salt, you're showing the value of relationships. That is what you will take into eternity with you. Your relationships, value them highly. Speak grace to the people in your life. Redeem the time also, I suggest, by sharing Christ. There will be, there will be no need of sharing Christ in, in eternity. For everyone will know God. There will be no sense of urgency then, but there will be now. Notice what he says in Jeremiah 31, verse 34. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. What a word of prophecy. Redeem the time. Share with those that are hurting and lost and broken. Give hope to those that have no hope. 
Speak uh, of what God has done in your life. You don't have to be an expert in the scriptures to tell people what God has done in your life, how he's blessed, how he's taken hold, how he's forgiven. Redeem the time also, he says, because life on earth is short. You have just a short time. Make the most of a short time. James chapter 4, verses 13 to 14. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and we will spend a year there and we will engage in business and make a profit. You do not know. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor. You're just a vapor that appears for a while and then vanishes away. It's such an interesting perspective. The time is short. Value the time. It's a gift. God gave it to you. Value the time. Some years ago, there was a, a, a good movie that came out. I know many movies are not good. This was great. It was called Paul, the Apostle of Christ in, all, in many of the theaters. I saw it. I hope some of you saw it. Paul, the Apostle of Christ. There's a scene in that movie. And it was, to me, a very great scene, deep. Paul, as you know, he was arrested. And uh, at one point, the Roman prefect who was overseeing uh, the imprisonment of Paul wanted to have a conversation with Paul, wanted to get to know this man who had become so infamous in the empire. And so he took him out of his prison and brought him to his garden. And there they sat and had a conversation. And for Paul, you can imagine, this is an opportunity. So at one point in the conversation with the Roman prefect, he said to uh, the Roman soldier, have you ever been sailing? And uh, the Roman prefect said, yes. Yes, I have. I have sailed. And he said, when you're out there and you see the vastness of the water, he said, you know, if you were to then reach down into the water with your hand and bring up that handful of water, it sifts through your fingers so that all you have left is just a little bit. And he said, most people, they focus their entire lives on that one handful of water that sifts through their fingers. But those who believe in the Lord God and they put their hope in Jesus, they look at the vast sea and that's where they put their hope. That's where they put their focus. I tell you what, if you were all here right now, you'd be going like, yes, what a powerful point. Life is a vapor. Do something to value the time. Have an eternal perspective. Don't value stuff over people. Use the good china, in other words. What are you saving it up for? Bless people. I remember some years ago when our, our kids were growing up and we had the, the three girls that uh, you know we had and then we adopted the boys and... And uh, we took all of us uh, bowling. And I remember we're all bowling and everyone's, you know, laughing and having a great time. And has it ever like a surreal moment just kind of hit you? And I, I, it hit me. There we were at the bowling alley. Everyone's laughing and just, you know, enjoying. And I'm, I'm sitting over there watching this whole scene. And it just hit me. How long do we have? How long do we have? This is a beautiful moment. How long will we have? Cherish, cherish, value, value deeply. I remember the night before our daughter was, was murdered. The night before, she was, she was killed on a Tuesday. And I remember the evening before Monday, I had called and asked if we could have a uh, get-together. So we, we met at Starbucks. It was an August, very warm August evening. 
And we sat outside of Starbucks and we just had something cold to drink. And we just sat there and talked for like hours, three hours. We talked. I will cherish those three hours the rest of my life. We talked about God. We talked about family. We talked about what mattered. We talked about love. We talked about the things of life, the real stuff of life. I'll cherish those for the rest of my life. Invest in that which is eternal. He's trying to give it. He gives us this perspective because he wants us to change our life. He wants to change how we live our lives right now. How we live matters. Invest in those things which are eternal. That's why Paul wrote in Philippians 3, verses 7 to 8. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's the greatest value of my life. See, I tell you what, when you get to the end of your life and you're on your deathbed and you're looking back on your life, I, I will guarantee you, you will not look back on your life and say, oh, I wish I had more stuff. I can guarantee you, you won't say that. I wish I had put more time into those I love. Redeemed. He's giving us this for a reason because he wants us to see the value of eternity to change our life right now. And here's also, here's also what he's showing us in Revelation 21. It's this, God himself will be with us. This is a key to an understanding of eternity. God himself will be with us. Verse 3 tells us, Behold, that the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself shall be among them. But would you also turn over? We did not read verses 22 and 23. Look at that with me. And he says, I saw no temple there. He's talking about the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, that holy city he described in verse 2. And he says, I saw no temple there. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God himself illumines it, and its lamp is the Lamb. What a perspective. It's God himself with us, with his people. It's been God's heart from the very beginning. You can go all the way to Genesis and see that theme that runs through the whole Bible. Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us, because it's been God's heart from the beginning. Adam used to walk with God in the cool of the evening. It's always been God's heart. That's why he's pursuing you. That's why he pursues relationship with you. That's why he knocks on the door of your heart. Because he wants relationship. He made you in his image. And he wants relationship with you. But notice also in Revelation 21, it tells us that the former things will not come to mind. John immediately explains that in verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. No more crying, no more pain. No more death, because the first things have passed away. This is spoken of in other places. Notice Isaiah chapter 65 or 17. For behold, God says through the prophet, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. So he says the very same prophetic word. There are so many things on this earth that cause pain. There are so many things on this earth that cause pain and tears. But these things will not come to mind or be remembered, he says. I tell you what, that's actually a great application. Many people would gain so much freedom if they would let go of the things that have hurt them in the past. These things will not come to mind. Let go of them now. Why do you keep holding them into your own mind? Let go. Too many people, too many people, they carry the accumulation 
of so many hurts and wounds. You live a long time. I'll tell you what. You live a long time and you're going to have an accumulation of hurts and wounds. How long are you going to keep holding on? How long are you going to carry your wounds and your pains? So they live in their own prison. They live in the prison of their own pain. And I'll tell you what, if you live in a prison of such pain, you will be robbed of joy. And you will be robbed of peace. God wants you to have joy. My joy I give to you. My peace I give to you. My love I give to you. God wants you to dwell in the presence of the living God. And a peace that passes understanding will guard your heart and mind. A joy, a deep-seated joy will be yours. Because you are dwelling in the shadow of the Almighty, you are experiencing the love of God. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. I press on, he says. I love, the, I love the boldness. I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's a great word. That's a great word. And then would you notice this in Revelation 21, tremendous application for our lives for eternity, but for now. He makes all things new. Verse 5. Follow, it follows powerfully. Behold, I am making all things new. I tell you, the Greek here is helpful. I am making all things new in the Greek because the, the Greek is very exact in its sense of time. And he's really saying it's in the present active. In other words, I am presently and actively making all things new. It's a powerful understanding. Here, we struggle, of course. Here on this earth, this life, this that we live, we struggle with things becoming old. Let's start with our bodies. Our bodies get old and worn out. Cars get old. Houses get old. All kinds of stuff gets old. I tell you what, in eternity, there won't be any need for new and improved. We keep finding ways to improve on the old, of course. And and. Think, I mean, you can just look around, think of how much things have changed just in the last 10 years. Technology, computers, iPhones, phones, tablets, you name it, all kinds of technology. But more than that, today we struggle with the flesh. And I'll tell you what, we won't have to struggle when God makes all things new. The condition of our flesh here is not the way things are going to be in heaven on earth. Mark 14, verses 38 to 39. Keep watching and praying, Jesus said. Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That is the problem. Romans 7, verse 18, Paul speaks of it similarly. I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. The willing is present, but the doing of the good is not. But you see, in heaven, in eternity, in heaven on earth, there will no longer be any sin nature. Hallelujah. There will no longer be. There will be no more brokenness, no more broken lives, no more broken marriages, no more broken relationships. However, it's very important to see he is making all things new right now. It is a promise for eternity, and it is a promise right now. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 to 27. Moreover, the prophet writes, I will give you a new heart. He's speaking for God here. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove that heart of stone from your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. In other words, you're going to have some life in you. 
He's in the process right now of making your life new in Christ. Don't be like you used to be. Old things pass away. Don't be like you used to be. If, if you are in Christ, you are in a process of transformation. God redeemed you out of the mess so that you don't stay in the mess. God it, it redeemed you out of the brokenness so that you don't stay broken. That's the whole point. He takes you, redeems you, takes hold of you, and then he transforms you to make you into the image of God's heart, the image of God in you. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away, new things have come, and he'll keep building new things in your life. Therefore, we have to see this in chapter 21. He gives to the one who thirsts, verse 6. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life. And he says, and I will give without cost. That speaks so, so powerfully. I will give to the one who thirsts, and I will give without cost. That's the gospel in one verse. That's God's heart right now. Isaiah 55 speaks to it, verses 1 to 3. Ho! It's a great Jewish word. Ho, everyone who thirsts. Come to the water, you who have no money. Come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. It's a spiritual lesson. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? Why do you spend your wages for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. That's a word out of the prophet Isaiah. It's been God's heart for years, and it's God's heart for you right now. Why do you spend money for that which does not satisfy? Why do you spend your wages for things that are empty? Have a view, have a view of eternity because he's going to do a work in your soul of life. Notice what Jesus said in John chapter 7, verses 37 and 39. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out. You can imagine him getting up on a rock or something and crying out to the crowds, listen to me. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and let him drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. From his innermost being will flow. In other words, you, you drink from the river of life. The presence of God, that's what it means. The Holy Spirit of the living God. You, you have that in that life in you. And from you, he says, will flow rivers of living water. You will be a blessing to the people in your life. And I'm telling you right now, that is exactly God's heart. He wants to transform you. He wants to fill you. He wants to satisfy your soul so that you, rivers of living water will flow out of you and bless the people around you. This is not just about, well, what can I take? What can I take? No. What can flow from you to be a blessing? Because I'll tell you, relationships matter. They are eternal. From his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. But when he was, he said, the promise of the Spirit will come. and You will drink of living water. What a picture is that, church? He's giving us a perspective. What are you drinking from? This stuff of the earth, the, the, that which flows in the earth, is going to perish. And it's poison. It's poison to the soul. But you bring life, the very life of God. You, you have that life of God within you, he says, and rivers of living water will flow from you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your heart. 
thank you for showing us your way. Thank you for showing us your desire to transform us. And I pray, God, as we study these verses today, it has taken hold. It's changed our view, changed our perspective so that we value the things of which are eternal. Lord, I pray for everyone who hears this message that your spirit would stir everyone that we would recognize what a gift, what a gift that we have been given. This life itself is a gift. Redeem the time. I gave you this as a gift. And it's a gift that will have eternal perspective. Would you today say to the Lord, I want to drink from the river of living water. For my heart is on you, God, and eternity is in my view. Eternity is in my view. Oh, God, I, I need you. I want you in my life. I want to drink from the, the river of life. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Church, come to the waters. Come drink from the well. Be satisfied in your soul. Let him transform your life. Let him make all things new. Don't hold on to the hurts anymore. Don't keep holding on. Let go and let the peace of God and the love of God and the joy of the Lord be yours. Father, thank you so much for stirring us. Your Holy Spirit is moving. It's touching hearts, drawing people to you. Church, let me say something to you. Just continue in a, in a place of prayer. But these promises that I'm mentioning to you today, these are amazing promises that come right from the heart of God. I speak from the authority of God's word to tell you, this is God's heart for you. But it begins with a relationship to the living God. And I invite you today, if you have not opened your heart and invited the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come into your soul, I invite you today to have that relationship. Let me just say this. God's pursuing you. God is the one pursuing you. He wants you to draw near. He's inviting you. He's inviting you. Would you open your heart? That's all you got to do. Open your heart. He's the one knocking. He's the one calling. He's the one pursuing. Would you? If you would open your heart to the Lord Jesus, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And in this prayer, you're going to invite the Lord into your life. I'm just going to lead you in this prayer. You just repeat after me. And you pray this way. God in heaven, I'm a sinner. And I'm asking that you would forgive my sin because of what Jesus has done for me on the cross. Forgive my sin. Come into my life. Come into my life. I want to have a relationship to you, God. I want to walk with you. Transform me. I want to know what it means to be your son or daughter. I want you in my life. In Jesus' powerful name.